Hey guys, welcome to the show today. We have a very exciting long form discussion episode for you today with another brave Ezekiel Watchman pastor friend of mine, Pastor Alec Rollins from Westgate Chapel in Washington, just north of Seattle. And Pastor Alec and his church were the first ones to threaten a lawsuit against Jay Inslee, the Washington governor, who's sort of this, uh, you know, Gavin Newsom wannabe, for his restrictions against churches during the scamdemic shutdowns in this country, while simultaneously allowing people to burn down whole city blocks across the country because COVID's woke and only targets religious conservatives, of course. And Jay Inslee backed off of some of his intense restrictions and began uh, his irrational pandemic treatment of institutions equally rather than unnecessarily targeting the church. But he backed off because of the bravery of this church. So I was so honored to join my friend, Pastor Alec Rollins of Westgate Chapel in... Edmonds, Washington, for his Apologia monthly series, once a month on Sunday nights, guests like Eric Metaxas and Charlie Kirk and so many other wonderful, brave men and women who are contending for righteousness in the public square. And so we discussed it all. We discussed the history of sexual education in America, the targeting of children, the need for the church to stand in this moment, the biblical narrative and standard for the value and dignity of life, the need for Christians, and the somber nature of this late hour in the fight. And we asked the question, is it too late? for the church to wake up and turn this American experiment around by tearing down the high places of Moloch and ending the genocide of abortion. We end with Q&A with the wonderful people at this event. Buckle up, you're in for a treat. I'm Seth Gruber, and this is Unaborted. Well, good evening, all. Welcome to another night of Apologia. If this is your first time with us, welcome. Let me start out by just sharing with you where the bathrooms and the water is. Very critical parts for a two hour amount of time together. So women's restrooms on that side of the lobby, men's restrooms on that side, lost and found is over there, water fountains over there. And if you uh, wandered in early, you perhaps had the chance to see the numerous tables we have, different organizations represented. Let me just highlight those quickly for you so at least you know it's out there. So you can make the most of the 10 minute intermission that we'll get later on. Um, we've got folks from 40 Days of Life, Abundant Life, the Next Step Pregnancy Center. Um, there's a group of Westgate folks who are working to be more present at school board meetings in the Edmonds area. Uh, FPIW, Family Policy Institute of Washington is out there. Uh, and we have a voter and initiative uh, signing table as well. So it is a buffet um, out there. Um, so I'd encourage you in the intermission we'll get, or even at the end of the evening, they'll be lingering out there just to check in, um, see what sort of resources they have. We'll save you um, a lot of Google searching, et cetera, um, if you find yourselves caring to be mobilized in certain ways um, after our time together this evening. So quick flow of the evening. First and foremost, part of the fun of Apologia is we spend about the last uh, 45 minutes answering questions that y'all text in. So that number will splash up on the screens behind me. Um, take a picture of it, make a note in your phone briefly. And can I encourage you as the evening progresses, I think the number will splash up. At some point, it'll, it'll come up. Um, and they'll put it up at various points throughout. But as questions come up for you, send them in uh, as soon as you can. That gives us a chance to compile them and pass them along um, to the speakers this evening. Um, if you wait until the intermission to send your questions, then that will be too late. So we'll do our best um, to get to most of the questions that you send in. You always do a very good job of giving us some good questions to work with. So, um, so that number will pop up and down on the screens. Um, as we go, I'm sure they're, um, they're sorting it out. So I promise it'll, it'll, it'll come up and down. There it is. Um, We'll let it linger there for a second so you can snag it. Uh, and aside from that, we'll spend about uh, an hour, our first hour, um, just in conversation um, with Seth. Uh, just kind of make an opening foray into the subject, and then we'll take a 10-minute intermission. We'll be back quickly. 10 minutes goes quick. Um, we'll be back quickly after that just to give you um, some details on a pro-life conference happening um, in short order in this area, and along with just some details on the upcoming uh, apologias in the months to come. So with that, all that said, 
Um, let me introduce you to our speaker this evening, Seth Gruber. Seth is the son of a pregnancy resource director, and he was raised in the pro-life movement, has been speaking publicly on behalf of unborn children since the age of 19. He's the founder and president of the White Rose Resistance, host of the podcast Unaborted, a nationally renowned human rights activist and sought after speaker. Seth is fighting for a world where every person has the right to be born. So would you help me welcoming Seth? Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to Westgate tonight. If you're from another church, we're honored that you'd come and be with us this evening. What an important subject we're tackling. Welcome to Seth Gruber. Uh, if you've not met him yet and don't know about him, he's a national voice for the whole ministry of the body of Christ in life issues and pro-life issues. Um, we'd heard of him when, when, when one of our elders and I went down to San Jose, California, just to stand in the crowd with that pastor, uh, Mike, who had been arrested yeah. and threatened with millions of dollars of fines for keeping his church open during COVID. And we went down just to be in the crowd. We met uh, Seth's pastor, uh, Rob McCoy, and uh, we didn't stay chatting with him very long before he took my phone out of my hands <laughs> and, and had me entered in a text thread, I think it's called, right? Uh, with a group of pastors who are not only pro-life, but very engaged in these kinds of issues. And I will frequently advance what's on that text thread to my family because it's a pretty lively bunch, as you would imagine. And then we saw Seth, li not live, but via Zoom, at a pro-life gathering in Issaquah. And uh, the minute I heard him, I thought, oh, this guy's fire. We've got to have him come. So, Seth, welcome. We're delighted <laughs> to have you, you with us Thank tonight. You. Yeah, amen. amen. Good to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, isn't, isn't it refreshing to have pastors who care more about truth and their obedience to Christ and their own reputation in the public square? And, and, and I, I'm seeing God more and more, um, this has been true of the last two years, uniting warrior pastors, Ezekiels, watchmen, sons of Issachar, who understand the times and know how Israel or the church now should live. Uh, because as my pastor Rob McCoy says, if we can't get over our theological differences, we're going to be debating them behind prison bars. And so it's about time for the church to start standing on behalf of life and liberty and our neighbor's rights. We're not demanding our rights, we're exercising our responsibility as American citizens and as stewards of what God has given us. And so I am so blessed by your Pastor Alec here and so many that God has been uniting in this season because it's exciting. It's it exciting is. to live in what you were called to do because you recognize that you've been called to something greater than yourself and your own church. You've been called to stand for truth. And when you do, oh, look, God blesses it. And look how this church grew because of your pastor's bravery in standing against the tyranny of Jay Inslee, uh, who I like to call the, the uh, Gavin Newsom wannabe, because um, yeah. I'm from California. So anyway. <laughs> uh, how many pastors are approximately are on that text string? Well, it, it actually uh, it filled up. There wasn't room to add any more. Oh, so okay. whatever the max is on iPhone, I think it's 20 or 25. And there really are pastors from all over the country, the country aren't yeah. there? Yeah. Yep, from uh, Washington to California to Maine. Yeah. Yeah. Very exciting. Yeah. So Seth, tell us, how did you first get involved in the fight for life? How did that happen to you? Yeah, well, so, I mean, I've been a pro-life activist since I was a fetus, actually. Um, and, uh, no, I'm actually not kidding. You laugh, but I'm actually not kidding. Uh, my mother was the executive director of a pregnancy resource center in Los Angeles County while pregnant with me. Uh, so I was flipping around doing backflips in the uterus uh, while my mother was saving children from abortion. And I've been told my body, my choice, so therefore all parts of me were actually part of my mother because that's hashtag follow the science. If you don't trust me, just you know, ask Fauci. Uh, and so it, it was actually me saving those children from abortion because 
because I wasn't a human, I was just part of my mother's body. And so, welcome to the uh, secular progressive la-la land religion known as Gnostic dualism. Um, and we'll get into that later. And so, um, that's sort of my legacy, that's my background. Um, and then I was homeschooled through eighth grade, went to public high school, and I did my senior project on the issue of abortion. At 18 years old at Whittier High School, Nixon's alma mater, I was very convicted that I actually didn't have good answers for many of the questions my pro-choice friends would pose to me. And if you know me at all, you'll know that I always love having the correct alignment of words in the spiciest, most satisfying <laughs> manner. And so even at 18, I was really frustrated with myself that I didn't have the tools of thought that I should have raised in the church with a pro-life family to answer some of these questions, which today I recognize are not that complex. But I think a lot of us struggle to implement and apply our Christian worldview to these cultural matters, which is why events like Apologia are so wonderful. And so I was like, I'm gonna do my senior project on abortion. So I had to write a research paper, I had to do volunteer hours, and I had to do a presentation at the end of the year before the Board of uh, Teachers. And was so I did- a, Was it a Christian high school? No, no, no. public, yeah, yeah. So, and when I selected the topic of abortion, Alec, at 18, Whittier High School said, um, you can't select that topic. They said, we have, um, oh, oh, look, it's right here on the website, um, Senior Project Guidelines. Oh, that's one of the topics you can't pick. Sorry, it's right there. And I said, um, here's a copy of the Constitution you're making me read in government class. I will be doing my senior project on the issue of abortion, or you're going to have a lawsuit on your hands. Um, and so I threatened a lawsuit at 18 years old. By the way, that's what happens when you're homeschooled. Okay. Um, <laughs> and, and so they backed off, and, and I did it anyways. And just a case in point, it's actually, it's actually an important vignette to make the larger point that when you stand against the forces of tyranny that want to silence the voice of truth in the church, um, a lot of times they're just puny little despotic wannabe Fauci's, and they fold like a cheap suit when you look them in the face and you say, sit down. And so that's what happened. And so at my home church, a woman who graduated a couple years before me came up to me and she said, Seth, I heard you selected the topic of abortion for your senior project. How did you do that? Because when I was a senior, Seth, I tried to pick that topic and they said no. And I said, and you let them. And so, so that's a lot of my background. And then I volunteered at a pro-life organization in Orange County because I grew up in LA County. And the pro-life organization was an organization my mom had sat on the board of in the early 90s whose executive directors are now my godparents. And so the first thing they had me do was to scan 200 images of first trimester aborted children with their mutilated body parts all over a medical table, categorize them in their database for their educational projects. At 18 years old, in a Christian homeschool family with a mother who was the director of a pregnancy resource center, I had never seen what abortion is and does to unborn children. So how many people in the secular culture do you think have actually seen the reality and horror of abortion? Mm. Ephesians 5.11 says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Mm. And so that was a real turning point in my life. So I went to Westmont College, a, a, a allegedly Christian college in Santa Barbara you should never send your children to. I can talk about that later. And I started the first pro-life club that had ever been there held dead baby photo signs on campus to challenge my institution for their refusal to take a pro-life position on abortion and for hiring pro-abortion professors at the university. And I could give you their names because I had email debates with them because they were pissed off at the activities I was doing as the, <laughs> as the president of the pro-life club. Mary Doctor, Omidi Ochang, uh, 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 Chris and, and, and Sherry Heckler. I mean, I'm t they, they teach at Westmont College, they're pro-abortion. Uh, and so I, I held signs of dead baby photos saying this is what, this is what Westmont supports. So that's my background. I graduated, started doing pro life speaking, and the rest is history. So. <laughs> you are so hard to have as a guest. Uh, we, you got to start opening up for us here, if you will. All right. <laughs> well, I'm sure I, I won't top Eric Metaxas. No. <laughs> that guy's entertaining. Yeah, yeah, he can. So uh, you went. Out of college, what did you do coming out of Whitman? Westmont. Yeah, Westmont. so I graduated 2014, um, so yeah, almost a decade ago. And I joined a pro-life group called Life Training Institute. And uh, they have a, a powerful, small team of professional pro-life speakers. And so they mentored and poured into me as I started speaking around the country nationally. Took a year and a half off when I got married, needed to make more money. God pulled me back into full-time pro-life ministry and speaking in the end of 2018. And then... Um, 
we moved to Godspeak Calvary Chapel in January of 2021. That's Rob McCoy. Yeah, because Pastor Rob said, move up here, move your family, I'll give you my studio, you'll run and develop a pro-life ministry at the church, we'll get you into every pulpit in California that I can, and let's take back life in California. And I was like, who are you, right? Uh, and by the way, a lot of the unity you've seen of American pastors who are patriots, who are fighting for life and liberty in America right now, names that you'd probably know, a lot of the unification that has happened has been because of Rob McCoy and Charlie Kirk. They have united many of these pastors in this season, and they just had their first annual Turning Point Faith Pastor Summit in Coronado in San Diego uh, just this last week. Mm. Uh, and, and hundreds of pastors from all across the country, absolutely wonderful and beautiful. Um, and so... We just moved to Kansas, actually, because this is where my wife's from, and I travel so much she needs the support of her family, which is out there. Um, but I still kind of consider God Speak Calvary Chapel my home church, and I'll be preaching there on September 4th, uh, September 4th as part of my national tour we're doing to launch my new organization. Um, and so, yeah, this is kind of my background. I started going on college campuses. We were just at UC Berkeley and Stanford. That was uh, interesting. Uh, we got hours of content of um, interactions uh, with about like 50, stu- 50 versus one, <laughs> like 55 students versus me. So we're going to start releasing some of those. We're planning a debate in November, hopefully in New Mexico. Uh, We're doing a national church tour right now for the White Rose Resistance. Um, And I keynote banquets for pregnancy resource centers. We do seminars, training things, uh, and then, you know, stuff like this. What's the ministry that you've just begun? So it's called the White Rose Resistance. So I'm moving from just Seth the pro-life speaker into building something much bigger than myself. I I felt sort of called in this season to develop a new organization And not to rap on the pro-life movement, because I've been a member of the pro-life movement my entire life, but I do think there is a culture of soft-soaping truth and saying it in such a way in order to avoid unnecessarily offending the people that we're trying to reach. And so it's not that the pro-life movement is lying. It's just that I think there is a culture of stopping just short of saying things as powerfully and succinctly and passionately as we should. And so I think the problem with that is sometimes you fail to create the sense of emotional urgency that you actually need to, Mm. to get people to live differently. Describing abortion as anything less than child sacrifice to pagan gods and demons actually fails to create the urgency that we need to get people to start living differently Mm. and recognizing the simple truth. The culture war was always just a proxy war for the spiritual war. And for too long, we've said, that's a political issue, Pastor Alec. Why are you such a GOP hack? We just preach the gospel. We're gospel-centered. Of course, you and I would say, well, your gospel's, your gospel's too small. Mm. Right? We're called to obey Christ and mm. contend for truth in every sphere. Not a compartmentalized Christianity that mm. puts politics over there, but a comprehensive Christianity mm. to get the church off the bench, get comfortable with being uncomfortable, and start contending in the public square for righteousness, for truth. As my pastor Rob McCoy says, the church has been waiting downstream to pick up human heartache that they helped create through their political abdication upstream. Mm. In Mm. other words, we pay lip service to mercy and justice issues and we make ourselves feel really good about how we're loving the least of these in our community. But the reality is many of those justice issues and many of the least of these among us could actually not have been created the least of these had you been contending upstream for godly politics Mm. that actually support the least among us and encourage liberty, freedom, and human flourishing. So it, it it may make you feel very good as an American pastor in church today to have these ministries in your cities, but the reality is, is that you're actually reaping the consequences of much of your political abdication. And so it's time for the church to wake up and recognize that the left merely labels every secular progressive moral revolution agenda item politics, because they know that so many pastors fear the label politics, and so they can label nearly any genocidal, debauched moral agenda that they have as follow the science or politics to keep the politically impotent pastor silent, mm. which is why I'm so grateful for you, Pastor Alec, mm. and the rest mm. of the pastors rising up in the season. And it reminds me of something. Mm. It reminds me of something that Martin Luther is attributed with saying. Attributed with saying. I don't know if it was exactly. But he said, if I profess with the loudest voice and clearest exposition yeah. every portion of the truth of God, except precisely that one point, 
at which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking. Yeah. I am yeah. not confessing Christ, however boldly I may be professing Christianity. Yeah. Where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proven. And to be steady on every other battlefield yeah. is yeah. mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at that one point. It's yeah. time for us to stop yeah. flinching because when the church stands up, Satan sits down, brothers yeah. and sisters. Yeah, yeah, amazing. At lunch, you, you summarized for us the spiritual nature you alluded to a minute ago. You summarized the spiritual nature of what's really going on with right. the abortion industry. Could you share that? I thought it was extremely yeah, powerful. Yeah, absolutely, brother. So I've been told for years by pastors who I tried to awaken to Satan's greatest pride and joy, which is abortion. Abortion is not just the sacrament of secular progressivism, it's actually the sacrament of Satan. Because abortion says, you must die so I can live. But Christ says, no, I must die so you can live. Mm. Peter Kraft, the Catholic philosopher, once said that abortion is actually the demonic parody of the Eucharist. That's why it uses the same holy words. Mm. This is my body. Mm but with the opposite blasphemous meaning. Yeah. So Christ comes and says, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me for the forgiveness of sins and eternal lives. The culture of death says, no, this is my body, my choice. And I'll kill whatever's inside of my body because the serpent told me in Genesis 3, I'm going to be like a god. So rather than accepting the broken body and shed blood of Christ for eternal life, the culture of death demands that we break the bodies and shed the blood of babies for eternal life. Mm. We do this through embryonic stem cell research, fetal tissue research, fetal organ harvesting, prenatal gene editing. Yes, that's a new thing from last year. The follow the science Fauci acolytes are now saying we need to experiment with editing the genes of babies conceived in test tubes, try to grow them past the unspoken 10-day limit so we can poke and prod and screw around with their genes. Now, the baby dies in the process, but <laughs> hey, if we can perfect that gene editing, we can apply it on ourselves when it's safe, and we can edit out of the gene code certain things that we don't like that make us more susceptible to certain diseases. Can I just explain all that to you in one sentence? The baby simply becomes a sacrifice on man's pursuit for eternal life. This is literally nothing new. So, so anyway, so I've had pastors say when I try to awaken them to that spiritual reality since I was like 20, and I'm like, hey, can I speak in your church? Do you want to speak on this? Can we do something together? And here were some of the objections I got. Well, Seth, I, I, we're not really a political church. We're more about Jesus, um, which is like, well, actually, Bonhoeffer would call that a cheap grace, a, a grace and Christ you've created in your own image to justify your apathy to the culture of death. Or they'll say, well, um, we don't want to offend any of the post-abortive men and women in our congregation um, because we don't want to heap more shame and condemnation on them that they're probably already feeling. So I'm just going to remain silent um, in order to what? To incur Pastor's silence on abortion does, does not spare his men and women hurt. It spares them healing. Talking on abortion from the pulpit might be the one thing that the broken men and women in your congregation need to hear the gospel in a way that they never have before, to have forgiveness and healing and liberation and freedom, to then be the most powerful voice in the culture of death because they can say, I've been there. Don't do what I've done. You can now stand in the middle of the road of the culture of death with a big sign that says, stop, <laughs> don't do what I did. So anyways, th these are all these, these objections I get. I think at the end of the day, to answer your question, it comes down to one of two things, either a complete lack of biblical clarity or secondly, bigotry. And you might be able to argue that that you can actually conflate those two things. So what do I mean by bigotry? Oh, Seth, that's not very nice. Why are you calling pastors bigots? Well, let's define the word bigotry. Discrimination against someone else, especially if it's based off of immutable characteristics. Is that a good definition? Because what's an immutable characteristic? Something you have no control over. <laughs> so isn't racism a particularly nasty form of bigotry? Because you don't have any control over your skin color. Isn't that why sexism is a particularly nasty form of bigotry? Because you don't have any control over your gender. I know that's a dangerous thing to say in the age of Bruce Jenner, but it's true. And so to assert that the church should remain silent on the issue of child sacrifice or on abortion is to absorb some level of soft bigotry. Because would those same pastors say that the church should not speak up on the issue of slavery if they were living in 1850? No, suddenly they have such moral clarity, right? This is what C.S. Lewis called chronological snobbery. 
We, we stand in 2022 from our pulpits and our pews and we look down our noses at churches who allowed injustices like the Holocaust and slavery and we think, those cheap grace degenerate Christians, how could they have allowed that? It's like, well, we allow our own Holocaust. We allow our own lynchings. They're called womb lynchings. And they happened at the tune of a million a year. By the way, if the Ku Klux, Ku Klux Klan could have known the devastation they could have wrought on the African-American populace by trading in a white hood for a white coat, they would have done it years ago. Mm. Abortion mm. is not just the number one killer. It is the number one killer of black children. And the womb is the most dangerous place for a black child to be. And later, if you want, we can get into that history of Planned Parenthood that very few people know. And so it is a form of soft bigotry to tolerate the bloodshed of the unborn in a way that pastors would never tolerate the bloodshed of born black people if they lived in 1850. So it's either a lack of biblical clarity or it's soft bigotry or it's both. I think the answer, as always for the church, is to go back to the scriptures. I think it's the authoritative, inerrant, infallible yeah. word of God yeah. that stands the test of time because it's based on the way, the truth, and the life. That's the name of the author. Yeah. And until we return to him, we're not going to end abortion in this country, and we certainly aren't going to have a revival in this country. So where can we turn to scripture to get the biblical clarity that we sense the pastors in our country are lacking? I can think of a couple. Um, some of God's most colorful language in scripture Sure, Pastor Alec, is actually when he's responding to the Israelites for their complicity in child sacrifice. Because people say, you know, well, the, Seth, you know, the word abortion doesn't occur in scripture. Well, I don't see the word there. It doesn't say thou shalt not abort. And then there, you have these stupid talking points in the church that say, Christians should speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible's silent. Have you ever heard that phrase or something? They're like, I just speak what's in the scriptures and if it's not there, I can't talk on it. Uh, but there's plenty of things the Bible doesn't condemn. But th does that mean it condones them? Or does that mean that it's neutral on them? Here's an example. Did you know the Bible doesn't condemn forced female circumcision? Pastor Alec, I guess Christians can't have a biblical opinion on that, huh? Did you know the Bible doesn't condemn the lynching of homosexuals? Hey, do you think, uh, church, we can develop spiritual clarity on those questions still? Yeah, and those woke Christians would probably tell us, well, Pastor Alex, see, the Bible provides a theological basis upon which to realize spiritual clarity on a whole range of moral issues right now do abortion. So the, the word abortion might not occur in scripture, but the Bible is more pro-life than we could ever imagine. Yeah. And so when the Israelites are teaming up with the Canaanites and they're building a furnace under the outstretched arms of a pagan god called Moloch or Baal, that looked like a bull by the way. Um, by the way, did you guys see those games in Britain in the UK where they brought out a bull and they started worshiping the bull to launch the games? By the way, Moloch was a bull. Every depiction historically we have of Moloch or Baal is a bull. <laughs> he was, just wake up, okay? And so when he's addressing the Israelites, God says in Deuteronomy or Leviticus, it's echoed a couple times, he says, it never entered my mind that yeah. you would do this. Yeah. Now, is God really saying, I didn't know? No, he's using language, even though he's omniscient, to communicate how yeah. horrific the Israelites' actions are. It never entered my mind that you would give one of your children over to Moloch. Okay, now let's say, you know, I don't know, the Carl Lentz or some woke Christian says, well, Seth, that analogy doesn't hold up because you're talking about infants that are already born. Okay, so the question becomes, does God see any distinction between the child in the womb and the child outside the womb. Mm. Wouldn't that be the question to answer? Because mm. if he doesn't see any distinction, then abortion is just as wicked in the eyes of God as child sacrifice of infants. Okay, where could we turn Pastor Alec in the Bible to answer that question? Um, well, Luke 1 and Luke 2 describes what? The prenatal John the Baptist doing backflips in the womb when Mary walks into the room pregnant with God, the prenatal deity who is at that moment knitting John the Baptist together in the womb because Christ was God in the womb and therefore is also knitting himself together in the womb while residing in a uterus that he once knit together because he created Mary in the womb of her mother as the prenatal incarnate deity. <laughs> yeah. Incarnation, yeah. mind blown. So <laughs> if you're kind of bored with your Christian faith, church, just wake up in the morning and dwell on the incarnation for 60 seconds and get out of bed like, whoa. <laughs> so God is not the God man at birth. He's the God man at conception. Yeah. So to be pro-choice as a Christian is actually a Christological heresy because it would maintain that Christ was at some point fully God but not fully human. Yeah. Therefore, every other baby created in his image in the womb would at some point be not fully human. Yeah. 
So you really think, well, Christian, you really want to defend to me that Mary had a fundamental right to abort your savior? Because if you don't, then you must necessarily be pro-life. Okay, so when John the Baptist is doing backflips in the womb, recognizing his creator, and then what, Mary's filled with the Holy Spirit at that moment, the word for baby, John the Baptist, leaping in the womb, is the Greek word brephos. Brephos, okay. Turn to Luke 2. It says, and Mary laid baby Jesus in the manger. Want to guess what Greek word church the writers of scripture use for the born Christ? Brephos. Hmm. The same term is used to describe a baby in the womb as a baby outside the Mm. womb, telling you that God sees no distinction Mm. between the child in the Mm. womb and the child outside the womb. Now, you might say, Seth, why didn't you do Psalm 139? Yes, you're knit together in your mother's womb, fearfully and wonderfully made, amen, couldn't agree more. But I think that's a powerful illustration of the baby in the womb and the baby outside the womb. God sees no distinction. Back to child sacrifice. God tells the Israelites, if any of you, it might be Leviticus 19, I'm sorry, brother. If any of you do sacrifice your children to Moloch or turn your face away, monkey see no evil, from that man, when, 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 he, when he sacrifices one of his children to Moloch, then I will cut you off from among the people. Yeah. You and all of you who follow after him in whoring yourselves or prostituting yourselves after Moloch. Mm. That might be some of God's most colorful language yeah. in the Old Testament. And it's regarding child sacrifice. Yeah. One more biblical example, Gideon, who I kind of want to name one of my sons after one day. As the Israelites are being oppressed by the Midianites, and it's like basically Bernie Sanders' utopian socialism, right? Or democratic, as democratic socialism, I'm sorry. And so the Israelites are, are creating wheat, and, and, and they're laboring, and then the Midianites come, and they just take it all away. And so Gideon's like hiding out in a cave, laboring, you know, it's tax evasion, or basically. And God comes to Gideon and says, you know, mighty man of valor. It's amazing. Calls him by his identity. And now, you, you can imagine, Gideon's thinking, where have you been? You told us you were going to protect us. You told us you were going to be our God. You told us that you took us out of Egypt. Where have you been? And so he's thinking, here's God talking to me. Let's freaking own some Midianites. Let's chop some heads, baby. Let's go. Theocracy, right? We've been talking a lot about theocracy. That was literally a theocracy. Let's go. And what does God start with? Does he start with the Midianite oppression? Does he start with Bernie Sanders socialism? Does he start with the Midianites robbing and stealing from the Israelites' labor? No, he says, go tear down that sacrificial idol to Moloch and to Asherah. Mm. The two gods, pagan deities, demons, that the Israelites were sacrificing their children to. Mm. Do you want to know God's heart for the church in this season? Start with the baby sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah. In Psalm 106, God tells the Israelites, you have sacrificed your sons and daughters to demons. Meaning, clarity, it was never a bronze dude. It yeah. was never a little idol. It was always just demons. Yeah. You have sacrificed your sons and daughters to demons. And God tells the Israelites, the land is desecrated with blood. Mm. And so, says God, I give you over to be ruled by those who hate you. Brothers and sisters, does it feel like we're being ruled by people who hate the bride of Christ in the Mm. church in America today? Mm. Maybe more so than any other time in all of our lifetimes. I wonder why. Could we say that perhaps God has given us over Mm. to be ruled by those who hate us because of the baby killing? Yeah, Gideon, Rise up, mighty man of valor, mighty woman of valor. Rise up and go tear down the sacrificial idols of baby sacrifice before I bless you and before I pour out my spirit and before I lead a revival in this country. If we don't tear down the high places of Moloch, not only will we never end abortion in this country, but it will only be a matter of time until one day we wake up and realize all of our other liberties and freedoms are gone as well. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Excellent. Excellent. So talk to us about what we can do about that. If we're going to go tear down the idols, what does that look like? Well, firstly, the high places of Moloch are crumbling a little bit. Roe v. Wade's overturned June 24th. Absolutely incredible. 
I was told my entire life that this would never happen in America. Of all the secular progressive sacraments, I was told of all of those, this was the one that was settled. Who was told by the activist media and the Democrat Party and the culture of death for years, Roe v. Wade's never getting overturned, it's a constitutional right, give up the battle. Mm -hmm. And yet every generation was increasingly more pro-life than their parents. Because my generation, and then now for sure Gen Z, grew up seeing the pictures of their siblings on the fridge while they were still in the womb. Because of the advent of technology and embryoscopy and ultrasonography, the unborn child has been humanized, excuse me, in a way that they never were before. And so young people grew up going, it's kind of a baby. <laughs> like, okay, Planned Parenthood. It's not a pregnancy. It's not a blob of insensate tissue. I remember my sibling pictures on the refrigerator. And so, and by the way, this is actually what the culture of death and the, I call it the abortion industrial complex. And here's why I use that term. You need to understand it's a behemoth, it's a Leviathan. It's one big thing. If you've ever heard someone say the liberal establishment, right? Or the Leviathan, we're describing a phenomenon that is, that historically we've seen before, but is kind of new to American Christians and patriots who are so accustomed to liberty and freedom that they forgot the price at which it comes. And so for decades, the bureaucratic state, un unelected, unaccountable agencies, and this abortion behemoth has been growing with the support of all of these institutions, the FDA, the CDC, the World Health Organization, and the Democrat Party, and it's become this Leviathan that is almost difficult to comprehend the size of. Hmm. I mean, if you're a Democrat today and you want to run, you probably won't get elected if you don't pay credence to Moloch. I'm sorry, to Planned Parenthood. I mean, th this is their centerpiece. And so we, we kind of have to recognize what we're up against. But this has always been their greatest fear, is that the child would be humanized. And let me prove it to you, just so you know that it's not just me saying this. I, I, I need you to recognize that they all know it's a human, and they all know they're killing babies. And, and if I have time, I can give you some quotes from, from major leaders, I call them pontiffs of progressivism, who have admitted this. Um, but one such man was named Harrison Hickman. Harrison Hickman was a former pollster for NARAL. What's NARAL? The National Abortion Rights Action League. And Harrison Hickman told NARAL at the 20th anniversary convention the following. He said, probably nothing has been as damaging to our cause as the advances in technology which have allowed pictures of the developing fetus. Because people now talk about the fetus in much different terms than they did 15 years ago. They talk about it as a human being, which is not something I have an easy answer on how to cure. Mm. Mm. One of the foremost abortion rights activists and a pollster for one of the largest pro-abortion organizations, not in the country, but worldwide, mm. just told you, gosh dang it, they're starting to talk about it as a human being. And I could give you lots of other quotes about these people, but they all know that it's a human being. So we need to recognize that for the pontiffs of progressivism, the leaders, the presidents of these organizations, the activists, we're not contending with people of good faith who have just been absorbing mistaken premises. Please do not think that we are contending with people of good faith who just need to be awakened and we need to show them the evidence and they'll change their mind. No, I believe some of these people have sold their soul to Satan, if not being full-on demon-possessed. They're not changing their minds. Now, there are many people in the country who sit on the fence, I've seen the polling, who aren't sure what they think about abortion. Maybe they support it in the first trimester, but they don't like abortion through point of birth. There are many American citizens who are persuadable, which is why you should be a voice for the unborn. I want you equipped to be a pro-life ninja. To, to always have an answer for those who ask you for the hope that you have in Christ, 1 Peter, but also how that hope and how that gospel impacts how you see other moral issues. But you need to understand, the people at the tippity top don't give a rat's butt about the truth, the unborn child, and their humanity. They simply absorb the strategies of the Nazis and the racists by calling their victim class Untermensch, subhuman, or Lebensunwertensleben, 
a Nazi, a German term that the Nazis used, meaning life unworthy of life. They know it's a human, they just don't care. So, so you need to sort of understand what we're contending against. But what can the church do in this season? Well, firstly, we just need to celebrate that Roe v. Wade got overturned. We should be riding this wave as long as we yeah. can. Yeah. And we should be getting more Christians on board with what God is doing. Because I believe God still intervenes in the affairs of men. And did you notice on June 24th when Roe v. Wade got overturned, there were just some fascinating happenings in the ether that aligned in very interesting ways. Now, listen, I know Christ said it is an evil generation that seeks for signs and wonders. So I'm not some kooky person who's trying to read the stars, okay? But as one Catholic priest, George Rutler, said, it is a stupid generation that ignores signs and wonders. Uh, so I'm not seeking for some alignment of the stars, but when something crazy happens, I think we should go, whoa, God, that's a little providential wink, like I'm still here, right? And, and so on June 24th, the day that Roe v. Wade got overturned, Pastor Alec, um, is in the Catholic calendar. Now, I'm a Protestant, but I have lots of Catholic friends because of the pro-life movement stuff, because they've been more faithful than Protestants, yeah. if you don't know them. Yeah, they have. And yeah, on the Catholic calendar, it's the nativity of um, St. John the Baptist. Now... June 24th, Nativity of John the Baptist. What is that a celebration of? It's the celebration of when Mary visits Elizabeth and the prenatal John the Baptist starts doing backflips in the womb. It's the celebration of that moment. Are you freaking kidding me? Yeah. June 24th is a day where we celebrate a prenatal human being recognizing his creator who's the prenatal God-man in the womb. And when that happens, they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm. Roe v. Wade gets overturned on that day. Come on. That's yeah. so cool, right? Yeah. So that was one thing I thought was fascinating. Another one was this. On June 24th, there was this thing called a planetary alignment. Um, and it was Mars, Jupiter, Venus, Saturn, and one other. Five planets all lined up, visible to stargazers by the naked eye. And I think the last time this happened was 2003. So fairly rare, <laughs> fairly rare. And um, an astrophotographer that's a thing, who captured the picture, the viral picture that went all across the internet and was reshared by every news media, ch news media channel. The name of the photographer was Wright Dobbs. <laughs> what was the name of the Supreme Court case that overturns Roe versus Wade? Dobbs versus Jackson. And the dude's first name is Wright. Like they were right in the decision. <laughs> Now, again, I'm not seeking for signs and wonders. I promise you, I'm not one of those kooky scientists. But, like, that's crazy! Yeah. Okay? And then, it, just in our, personal fa in our personal life, I was back in California preparing the house to move out to Kansas. And I wake up to my phone blowing up, obviously, because of the time change, and I was all tired. And then I hear Roe v. Wade gets overturned. And my wife texts me a picture of my son, Cedar Justice, who's four and a half, who was sitting in the back seat on one of those drawing pads that you can press one button and it erases. And he was quiet for like 15 minutes. And so if you, if you know my family, you know my son's like me. He never shuts up. And so my wife was like, why is he so quiet? And then like when she parked, he had drawn a picture of a pregnant mommy with a baby in her belly. And it was like the best drawing he'd ever done. Like it looked really good. After 15 minutes of working on it, and he was like, mommy, look, I drew a picture of a, a mommy with a baby in her belly. Isn't my drawing good? And he draws this, like his best drawing ever of a baby in the womb on the morning of June 24th. So... Anyways, God still intervenes in the affairs of men. We should yeah. celebrate that and we should recognize that we need only act. And he will bless our endeavors and our actions on behalf of the least of these. Practically, what should we actually do? Do something. Mm. I would encourage you to prayerfully consider standing outside of today's death camps. Mm. It's actually a test for the Christian to answer a question for yourself. Do I see no distinction between the child in the womb and the child outside the womb? I know my Savior doesn't, but do I see any distinction? Church, ask yourself this question. If they were killing two-year-olds, if they were killing one-year-olds, would we live different? I think we would. I hope we would. Mm. I just Googled, because I've been in this area a lot, but I don't live here. I just Googled on my phone abortion providers on maps. There are roughly 20 within 90 minutes of any direction. Because, you know, Planned Parenthood performs one-third of the annual abortions. What are the other two-thirds? Obstetricians, hospitals, and privately owned abortion chains. 
So I, I found lots of Planned Parenthoods, but I also found hospitals that don't do them. I also found freestanding privately owned abortion centers. Now, I'm from California. We got a lot of killing centers, too. For nearly 50 years, the church has been like the Levite and the priest in the parable of the Good Samaritan. We have walked by and driven by on the other side of the road where we know innocent human beings are scheduled to die. Because remember, the Levite and the priest were religious leaders, right? They were the pastors of their day. Did you know, by the way, the Levite and the priest were personally anti-street mugging in their own life? <laughs> they knew the law of God. They knew that they were supposed to love their neighbor. But when they saw a neighbor, I think Luke's gospel says he's half dead on the side of the road. They don't go out of their way to fulfill their calling and love their neighbor. They go out of their way to avoid loving their neighbor. We have been doing that to our unborn neighbors for nearly 50 years. And brothers and sisters, I put myself in that critique. I know that I sound harsh right now to you. I'm putting myself into that camp. I have not. Alec has not. You have not. We have not mm. lived in response to this genocide like we're called to as Christians. Mm. The beauty of the gospel is there's forgiveness of sins. If, if Paul can slaughter Christians and oversee the stoning of the first Christian and become the greatest evangelist ever, then there's still hope for you. Yeah. I'm not saying that you need to rent your garments and scream and go kill yourself. I'm saying let's start living differently. Mm. Now, I know that's a scary, daunting prospect, prospect, and I know that violence against pro-lifers is escalating in this season, which should tell you the spiritual battle that it represents. Mm. We tell them that, oh, we're not making abortion illegal, we're just sending it back to the states. Our democracy, right? The left always screams about our democracy is in danger. Well, overturning Roe v. Wade was democracy, was sending it back into the hands of the people, and they lost their freaking mind. Because inwardly, you've got the thousand, the fire of a thousand suns burning in Elizabeth Warren's eyes and Bernie Sanders' eyes to their Aztec gods, Witzelapokli and Tislatapoca and all these ancient pagan deities that demanded human sacrifice. That's really the spirit of the Democrat Party today. Anyways, I digress. They're losing their minds because we just told them, let states decide, maybe? I don't know. And they're like, Whoa! Remember Elizabeth Warren when it got overturned? She was like, I'm angry! I'm determined, but I'm angry! It's like, yeah, we know. Like, we know you, you, got your, you got your axe right there, ready to go kill some more people and scalp them, because remember, she's an Indian, don't you remember that? <laughs> um, anyway, sorry about that. But it really is this demonic spirit in the Democrat Party. Now, I'm not saying if you're a Democrat, you can't be a Christian. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying you need to understand that that is the party of Satan. That's where he lives. Oh, Seth, are you saying the GOP is the Jesus party? No, I'm not saying that either. I'm not saying Jesus would be a Republican or a Democrat. I'm just saying one party is built their platform yeah. on the yeah. mutilated bodies of 65 million babies. Yeah. And if you have no problem associating with that party, then I think you have deeper spiritual questions to ask yourself about your own yeah. faith. Yeah. And we need yeah. to say that very clearly. Yeah. So we have ministries available to you like Love Life, like Abundant Life, and you're gonna hear from Beth a little bit later. We have a table to learn more. I put a conference on called Love Life California on January 29th at Calvary Chapel Chino Hills, my friend Pastor Jack Hibbs Church. We're doing another conference called Love Life Washington here on October 1st, well, at Cedar Park Church, which you're gonna hear about later as well. All ways for you to get connected in tearing down the high places of Satan. Yeah. But there's many ways for you to get involved, but I think it has to start with the question, do I see no distinction yeah. between that image bearer in the womb and my own children that I hold outside the womb? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Sorry, I got on a soapbox. No, there. no, you're doing awesome. <laughs> you're doing awesome, Seth. Um, you mentioned at lunch, too, that there's maybe a little bit of money involved in all of this as a motivator. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the abortion industry is a multi-billion dollar industry uh, in America and worldwide. Um, and we know this from former abortionists who have turned pro-life. Uh, and if you come to Love Life Washington conference on October 1st at Cedar Park Church, you'll hear from Dr. Anthony Leventino, one of my friends who was an abortionist. And he repented, came home to Christ, and has given his life over now to being a voice for the unborn. <clears throat> so we have the stories from people who killed the children, who God has brought back home, mm. and who now give very clear stories about how much they get paid per child. Mm. And of course, you know about 
the exposing of um, Planned Parenthood by the Center for Medical Progress with David Daleiden and Sandra Merritt. David Daleiden, who's still being criminally prosecuted, by the way. He's the only undercover journalist in California history to be criminally prosecuted for exposing illegal behavior. Planned Parenthood was selling dead baby body parts on the black market to interested third parties and putting dollar signs on all of the body parts of the children that they killed. So they get paid to kill the baby. Then they also get paid to sell, pick apart the limbs and body parts and organs of the child and the, the brain. Oh, that's worth a lot. And sell it to interested third parties. And he's still being criminally prosecuted. Oh, you want to know who, under, who oversaw that investigation, by the way? Kamala Harris. Well, attorney general in California, who was at the time having her pockets lined by campaign contributions from Planned Parenthood. And then when she left to become a senator, Xavier Becerra took over and continued the same criminal prosecution. Xavier Becerra, who's now the director of the Health and Human Services Department, and his assistant, Richard Levine, a man who thinks he's a woman. And Xavier Becerra sued Catholic nuns in California because they said, well, so, um, so Xavier, um, we're nuns, so um, we don't have sex, so we don't want to fund abortifacients and contraceptives in our healthcare plans. And Xavier Becerra goes, fund it! Put it in your house. Like, dude, they're nuns. They don't have sex. What is your deal with nuns? Why do you want them to fund abortifacient contraceptives in their healthcare plans? That's who Xavier Becerra is and continued the same criminal prosecution against the undercover journalist and went after pro-life pregnancy centers in California get this, to try to force them to advertise where the local abortion mill is on the walls of the building at the Pregnancy Resource Center. That would be like telling PETA to put signs and ads up for the local butchery on the walls of their company building. Like, what? That's who Xavier Becerra is. And so we've exposed all of this. This happened in 2015 with David Daleiden, who's now like 31 or 32 years old, and they're still going after him because of what he exposed. Um, and so it's a very profitable industry. Yeah. They make a lot of money. Um, and uh, once again, until the church rises up, none of this is going to stop. I, I love the unity in the pro-life movement. I love that there are atheists, secularists, deists, Catholics, progressives, and Christians. I love it because the abolitionist movement in America was not run by a bunch of Protestant Christians. Right. There were a bunch of other people involved in the abolitionist movement. It's a wonderful, beautiful thing. However, I don't think abortion will end until the church wakes up in America yeah. and decides it's time for this yeah. to stop. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So talk to us about the White Rose ministry that you're starting. As someone who grew up in the pro-life movement, I heard the, this story of a woman named Sophie Scholl for years. And I would see it shared by pro-life leaders on Facebook. And I would sometimes see it reshared in newsletters. So I was familiar with the name Hans Scholl and Sophie Scholl. And I was familiar with the White Rose Resistance. But only recently in the last couple of years did I start really studying it. And it awakened my heart for a new passion and commitment to the pro-life movement that I, I, even I didn't have before. I know that's maybe hard for you to believe, but I've given my life to this, and yet this was like a bunch of jet fuel back into my engine. And I started dwelling on it and praying about it, and I believe God has given me this story and movement as the response to Roe v. Wade getting overturned to gird up the loins of the church and contend with the culture of death to quote my friend Charlie Kirk, to play offense with a sense of urgency. I think that the pro-life movement has been being led by so many faithful, beautiful souls who have committed themselves for so long, and they're tired. Mm. And I can tell you as someone who's been doing this full-time since 2014, and in some capacity since 2011, I'm tired. Mm. I have a third baby on the way. I travel a lot. My wife is pregnant. She gets very sick. I'm on the road a lot. I'm tired. But you know what? I'm more tired of child sacrifice. Mm. And I'm more tired of an apathetic sleeping church. And so I believe that this is a secret strategical weapon that I believe can accomplish something that's very difficult. And it's this. And you know this as a pastor, Alec. The job of moving people who believe all of the right things into action. Pastor Alec knows this. This is the mm. role of a preacher. It's hard. 
to take people who say, I agree with that. Amen, brother. How are you? I'm praying for you. And to actually get them to begin contending against the spirit of the age, sharing the gospel, living in truth. It's a difficult job. And the church has been full, filled for decades with people who would espouse Christian beliefs, mm. but not stand in a day like today. And so I, I think it's a providential movement and story God's given me. And I'll share it with you a little bit of that story um, as we wind down. I don't even know how much time we have left. But the White Rose Resistance was one of the least known and most inspirational stories from Nazi Germany. I just told the story to Kirk Cameron and Nick Vujicic, and they had never heard it before. Very few people have heard this story, and yet it moves your heart, it breaks your heart, and it boils your blood because you want to be like them. Mm. You want to resist the evil of your times. And so in 1942, a young woman named Sophie Scholl encountered something called Leaflets of the White Rose. And she begins reading this leaflet, Alec, and it's explicitly condemning the crimes of the Nazis and calling the good people to wake up. The first leaflet ended with this sentence. We are the White Rose resistance. We are your conscience. And we will not leave you alone. So the goal of the White Rose Resistance was not solely to say, hey, evil people are doing evil things. They suck. It was to say, what are you going to do about it? Mm. It, was mm. to, it was to prick the collective conscience of the culture and awaken the church to action. And so at 21 years old, Sophie Scholl, with dreams of becoming a school teacher, comes across one of these leaflets, and she's stirred to action. She had a deep and abiding Christian faith. She loved the Lord. We know that from her writings and her letters with her boyfriend and her family. So come to find out, the White Rose Resistance had not only been co-founded, but was being led by none other than her older brother, Hans. So you can imagine 21-year-old Sophie's surprise, like, what the heck, bro? You're like a total badass. <laughs> why, why did you not include me? But you can imagine for Hans at 24 years old, he was trying to protect his little sister. Do you understand how dangerous Christian resistance activity was in 1942? Yeah. yeah. People were killed for far less. So Sophie demands to join the White Rose Resistance. And at 21 years old, she becomes the only woman and the youngest member in the Munich chapter. Their bravery spawned other White Rose chapters across Germany. So what did they do? Well, they were writing, printing, and distributing anti-Nazi leaflets all around Germany. They would stay up all night writing and printing these things. They'd get some funding from, from some, you know, nationalist, true nationalist Christians who helped pay for the postage and the envelopes because you couldn't buy them all in one place or the Nazis would wonder what was happening. Then they'd send them across Germany or take trains through the middle of the night and drop off piles of these illegal leaflets in major German cities. So this is before Facebook, obviously. This is how you communicate. This is how you get information out there. They're calling out the crimes of the Nazis. They did an entire leaflet on the Holocaust. Hans had served on the front lines and had seen Jews rounded up for slaughter. So on February 18th, 1943, the White Rose Resistance took things to the next level. And Hans and Sophie, his brother and sister, walked onto the campus at the University of Munich. Sophie demanded to be the one to carry the suitcase full of hundreds of leaflets because she argued, as a 21-year-old young woman, she was far less likely to be apprehended or searched. Brave, beautiful soul. During class time, when the halls weren't as busy, they began dropping off piles of these leaflets all across the university. And after a few minutes, when they were running the risk of being caught, Sophie walked up to the third floor balcony and she shoved an entire stack of leaflets down to the atrium below. Now what happens when you throw paper? It goes everywhere. Unfortunately, the janitor, who was a committed Nazi, caught Sophie in the act called the Nazis and had Hans and Sophie arrested on the spot on February 18th, 1943. For the next four days, they were questioned, they were interrogated, they were brutally abused. They refused to implicate any of their other friends. Hans tried to protect Sophie, saying that she was playing a prank and just hitting stuff around and she didn't even know what she was doing. But she got implicated and they found incriminating evidence at their apartment that implicated their friend Christoph Probst. 
who they did not want there that day because his wife was in the hospital recovering from giving birth to his child. The three of them were then taken to the guillotine on February 22nd, four days later. It was one of the most quickest and brutal examples the Nazis made of resistance fighters. Bonhoeffer spent over a year in prison for smuggling 14 Jews out of Germany and awaited trial in Tuggle prison before he was implicated in the, the Valkyrie plot to assassinate Hitler. Four days. And it was, it was as if in these four days, God would condense all of Sophie's passion, fire, and clarity into words that rise above the spiritual clarity of the pulpits in Germany at the time. In fact, Hans and Sophie and the White Rose had a meeting scheduled on the calendar to meet with Dietrich Bonhoeffer to connect with other resistance fighters, and they never made that meeting. Sophie understood something that we need to understand as a church today. We need to stop being surprised that evil people do evil things. Mm. Wake up, learn your history. The 21st century was the bloodiest, the 20th century was the bloodiest century. Wake up. Evil people do evil things. Start doing something about it. And so near the end of her life, Sophie said, the real damage is caused by all of those millions who just want to survive. The honest men who just want to be left in peace, right? Those who don't want their little lives disturbed by anything bigger than themselves. Those with no sides and no causes. Those who won't take measure of their own strength for fear of antagonizing their own weaknesses. Those who don't like to make waves or enemies. Those for whom freedom, honor, truth, and principle are only literature. Those who live small, die small. It's the reductionistic approach to life. If you keep it small, you'll keep it under control. If you don't make any noise, the boogeyman won't find you. But it's all an illusion. Because they die too. Those people who roll up, roll up their spirits into tiny little balls so as to be safe. Safe. From what? Life is always on the edge of death. Narrow streets lead to the same place as wide avenues. And a little candle burns itself out. Just like the flaming torch does. I choose my own way to burn. Brothers and sisters, who talks like that at 21 years old? That sounds like something Bonhoeffer would say. That sounds like something William Wilberforce would say. That sounds like something Oscar Schindler would say. What? It was as if God had condensed her entire fire, life, and clarity into four days. Her bravery in the face of death so, dis so disturbed the prison guards that they relaxed the rules the final day to allow Hans and Sophie to meet with their parents one last time. Sophie's, parent, Sophie's mother looked at her and said, remember Jesus, Sophie. And Sophie said, yes, but you too, mama. Sophie's cellmate, Elsie Gebel, who survived the Holocaust and later wrote letters to Sophie and Hans' parents to tell them about their daughter's final four days, described one of Sophie's final lines before she was taken to the guillotine. And Sophie looked out the window with bars on it in her prison cell. And she said, how can we expect righteousness to prevail when there's hardly anyone willing to give themselves up individually to a righteous cause? Such a fine sunny day. And I have to go now. But what does my death matter if through us Thousands of people are awakened and stirred to action. The prison guard said that the executioner said that he had never seen someone meet his end as she did. 
Sophie and Hans believed that their actions would incite a revolution, an army of resistance to bring the entire Nazi machine to a grinding halt. They understood what Edmund Burke famously said, that all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. They lived that and they had their heads chopped off for it. So I'm building the white rose resistance for this generation, for our church, to end our silent but far more deadly holocaust mm. of abortion, to contend with the spirit of the age, to prick the collective conscience of the culture, and awaken the church to action before it's too late. Mm. John Stuart Mill once said that a man who has nothing for which he is willing to fight, nothing which is more important than his own personal safety, is a miserable creature who has no chance of being free unless made and kept so by the exertions of better men than himself. And for decades in America, we have drinking deeply from the streams of liberty while allowing others to avoid yeah. people poisoning the water hole. Yeah. We've taken our freedoms for granted. We stand on the shoulders of giants and we think that we're flying. But others bled and died and sacrifice for those liberties and freedoms. Yeah. And I believe we are in a final fight here. Yeah. We are in a late hour. And if we do not wake up soon, we will, those with courage, those with clarity, those who stand in a day, will end up very similar yeah. to the shoals. And if you think I'm speaking hyperbolically, study your history, see what's going on, wake up. The Biden administration last week, last week, just said that if obstetricians are not willing to perform abortions because they're personally pro-life, then we need to be able to have discrimination lawsuits against them. California is becoming a sanctuary state for killing babies and is proposing a piece of legislation right now that would say medical students in California who want to become doctors cannot go through medical schools in California unless they agree to go through trainings for abortions. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the Board of Obstetricians and Gynecologists that license physicians, that determines if you as a doctor get to be licensed and practice, just said last week that if you're sharing misinformation and disinformation, you should have your license taken from you. What do they mean by misinformation and disinformation? They mean if you say the abortion pill's dangerous, they mean if you say the abortion pill reversal is safe and has over a 65% save rate because it's just progesterone, a natural hormone that reverses the effects of the abortion pill. And if you say that abortion has any effects or links to mental health, preterm labor and subsequent pregnancies and breast cancer, if you do any of those five things, that's what they mean by misinformation and disinformation. And ACOG, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists is radically pro abortion. And before Elena Kagan was on the Supreme Court, colluded with Elena Kagan to change the definition of partial birth abortions as a never necessary procedure to save mom's life to a sometimes necessary procedure to save mom's life. So Bill Clinton could have the science on his side when he vetoed the partial birth abortion ban act in 2001 or 2002. That's who ACOG is, radically pro-abortion group. The people who think it's okay to kill babies, because I guess they're untermen, subhuman, non-persons, they now are saying that they're just going to follow the science, and it's those pro-life doctors that don't follow the science. And so if you don't want to perform abortion at your practice because you're pro-life and a doctor, you should just have your license taken from you. Or if you share with women that, hey, if you regret taking the first regimen of the abortion pill, there's another pill that can reverse it. Oh, license taken! Here's a question for you, church. Where do you think all of this ends? Phyllis Schlafly, Phyllis Schlafly fought against the Equality Act decades ago. In 2021, the Democrats tried to pass the same Equality Act. Of the many things it was going to do, it was going to rewrite the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which then also included protections later for women against sex discrimination, and they wanted to change sex to include pregnancy as a condition of sex, so that if a pro-life doctor said, I'm pro-life, I'm not gonna kill your baby, that would be pregnancy discrimination, which is a form of sex discrimination, so you should be sued for not wanting to perform an abortion. They were trying to do this decades ago through the Equality Act that Phyllis Schlafly successfully defeated, and they're still trying to do it today. Yeah. The only thing standing in their way is you. 
if you're willing to rise up and say, stop. My great fear, and I'll end with this, is that we will not. Yeah. And we will repeat the despotic chapters of history where the good people just stayed silent for a little bit too long. Yeah. Which was why Dr. Mildred <clears throat> Jefferson, the woman who turned Reagan pro-life and was the first black woman to graduate from Harvard Medical School and started the National Right to Life Committee, one of the oldest pro-life organizations in the country, once said, today it is the unborn child. Tomorrow it is likely to be the elderly or those who are incurably ill, who knows, but that a little later, it may be anyone who has political and moral views that do not fit into the new distorted order. Yeah. Yeah. Martin Niemöller, a member of the Confessing Church with Bonhoeffer who was not killed by the Nazis and spent time in a concentration camp, famously said after World War II, first they came for the socialists. And I did not speak up because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists. And I did not speak up because I was not a trade unionist. Mm. Then they came for the Jews. And I did not speak up because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me. There was no one left to speak up for me. Yeah. We're living in a Kairos moment. Yeah, right we now. are. And if yeah, we don't we wake up soon, yeah, we're we all going to be Martin Niemollers. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. We got to pray, huh? We got to pray. <sighs> Father, in the holy name of Jesus. We come before you tonight. We've heard enough right here to, to launch an army in this Pacific Northwest region. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that has spoken so clearly tonight. Thank you for the call of your spirit to wake up your church. We ask, Lord, you would begin your work with us. Begin your work in me. Let the power of your Holy Spirit begin to change not only how we think, but change how we act. Amen. Would you raise up here at Westgate Chapel men and women who are willing to put their faith on the line? Follow the action steps that others wiser than us outline for us, but begin to move forward. Thank you for the organizations represented in the lobby tonight. Thank you for the years of their faithfulness when the church has been even more silent and disengaged than it is now. And here in the Northwest, Lord, and around the nation, wake up your pastors. Wake up churches. Wake up your believers so that by your grace and under the power of your spirit, we tackle the enemy head on. You've said our weapons are mighty to the tearing down of strongholds. And we exercise those weapons tonight. The weapon of prayer being one of them, but also the weapon of engagement and action. And we devote ourselves to your purposes, to your kingdom and to the sanctity of life that you authored, Lord. This is your life. Every baby is your life authored in this world today. Grant your church the courage and the backbone to stand up and begin defending that life. Do something in the Pacific Northwest that is greater than our cumulative actions are able to accomplish. You're the God who takes Goliaths down. You're the God who turns the enemy on themselves so that when the Jewish people wake up in Jerusalem, the, the, the Sennacherib and his army have disappeared into the night. Yes. But Lord, don't, don't, we don't, we're not asking you to do it without us. If you can use anything, Lord, yes, you Lord. can use me. Yes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We're going to take that 
eight minute break. It'll simply shorten our amount of time, but we've got your questions that we've processed for Seth. Would you join me in thanking him for being here tonight? Hey guys, we are about to jump into Q&A with Pastor Alec and the wonderful audience at this Apologia Night at Westgate Chapel in just one moment. But I want to invite you into being a part of what I'm building in this post Roe versus Wade moment, what feels sort of like a post-political moment. Our politics, our polity is so decayed. Justice is dead. We have two-tier justices in this country in terms of how Americans are treated and how injustices are addressed. And I want to submit to you that a major reason for that is our tolerance of child sacrifice, of abortion in America. You see, those who murder the unborn cannot be trusted to govern the born. And we're sensing the late hour that we are at in the culture wars, which was always just a proxy war for the spiritual war. And so I'm building a new organization to play offense with a sense of urgency, to not sugarcoat our truths, to put all hands on deck, to lay it all out on the field, to get comfortable with being uncomfortable, and to do something that's very difficult. And that's awakening the moral intuitions of people who know better and agree with us internally, but have not done anything before to stand against the culture of death, to stand against the sexualization of children, and to stand against the genocide of babies in their mother's wombs. As any pastor knows, the most difficult job is to take someone who believes all the right things in their head and get them to live it out in their life. We have millions of pro-life Americans and Christians in this country who have never done a thing or lifted a finger to stop the killing. Those are the people we need now or we are never going to end this Holocaust. And so I'm building the White Rose Resistance for this generation based off of the brave, incredible story of young German Christians who gave their lives to stand against Hitler and his regime, Hans and Sophie Scholl and Christopher Probst and Willie Graf and many others who were guillotined for their trouble and their anti-Nazi resistance activities. They were distributing anti-Nazi leaflets all around the country to prick the collective conscience of the country and awaken the church to action. In the final days of Sophie Scholl's life, she said, how can we expect righteousness to prevail? when there's hardly anyone willing to give themselves up individually to a righteous cause. Such a fine sunny day and I have to go now. But what does my death matter if through us, thousands of people are awakened and stirred to action? We cannot expect righteousness, life or liberty to prevail when there's hardly anyone willing to sacrifice for those rights that we've taken for granted for so long in this republic. And so I am building the White Rose resistance against our silent but far more deadly holocaust of abortion. And I'm inviting you to become an ally of the White Rose resistance at $35 a month. Can you do that? Just $35 to help me build something that I believe will be a pain in the ass, a stick in the eye, a fly in the ointment against the abortion industrial complex and the culture of death. You know that I'm specially appointed and equipped for this season to tear down the high places of Moloch and abortion and make a public spectacle of the abortion industry and their cronies and their pontiffs. And I need your help to raise up thousands of South Grubers, equip the next generation to be pro-life ninjas, an ambassador for the unborn, an unapologetic voice for our pre-born neighbors and contend in the public square to push the narrative and the envelope about the evil that we are facing. We will not end this until the good people wake up. Ronald Reagan once said that evil is powerless when the good are unafraid. And unfortunately for decades, the good have been very, very afraid in America and not done anything to contend for the rights of little babies in their mother's wombs in the same location we all came from. Go to the whiterose.life, help me do this. And I believe this will be one of the largest pro-life organizations in seven years because people are ready to fight. People are waking up and I need your help to wake them up out of their coma, get them engaged and equipped onto the field of battle. We have a lot coming to you soon. The White Rose Resistance National Live Tour that you're going to be very excited about kicking off this Sunday, August 21st in Indiana. 
followed by uh, Cedar Park Church in Bothell, Washington, followed by Awaken Church in San Marcos, California, and many more getting booked. But go to thewhiterose.life and become an ally of the White Rose and receive our leaflets of the resistance on a weekly basis to equip you to be a pro-life ninja. Thanks so much for tuning in. Enjoy this Q&A with Pastor Alec Rollins. I am so grateful for the Christian schools we have in this area. I know we have, understand a couple of representatives here from Kings and Cedar Parks doing a great job. Uh, we, we had a discussion over lunch, Seth, about the sexualization of our children. Uh, the sex ed curriculum was the first alert that we got here that things were changing. You, at lunch, you tied it all together for us. Yeah, so we actually saw this question come from someone. So we're not ignoring your other questions. We are actually answering one right now. Um, but it's actually very significant because what, what we have to understand is this was always the same movement. Okay, the, the, the sexualization of children, the sexual revolution, and a lot of its goals, and the abortion industry are not two separate things. They are one and the same. In fact, the, the sexual revolution was very successful in taking over the women's rights movement of the 60s to become one and the same. A very important lesson for you to learn. Um, uh, who was the uh, feminist mystique? Betty Friedan was initially not for abortion. And of course she started the National Organization for Women. Now, ever heard of that organization? Rapidly pro-abortion today. Betty Friedan was not pro-abortion. She wanted feminist goals that you and I would agree with. She became more radical later, I understand. But initially, it was equal treatment in the workplace, not getting fired for being pregnant. Okay, like most of us in this church would probably not have any problems with the primary goals of first wave feminism. It gets nastier later. So you had sexual revolutionaries like Lawrence Later. Go, go do some research sometime on Larry Later, Lawrence or Larry. Larry Later, he's been called the father of abortion. He's also been called the father of the sexual revolution. And he worked on Betty Friedan for years to put abortion into the National Organization for Women's Political Platform, uh, along with other pro-abortion leaders before 1973, before Roe versus Wade. So there's been a long agenda to connect much of these movements for a long time. Now, you've been hearing the term over the last few years, comprehensive sexuality education. By raise of hands, who's ever heard of comprehensive sexuality education, right? Or sex ed in general, they're usually referring to the same thing. Much of the sex ed, sex ed that's being exposed in public schools today is CSE, comprehensive sexuality education, where essentially it's pornographic material, it's exposing children to any and all forms of sexual activity, even the most dangerous, because they're functioning off of a premise that was initially constructed by a man named Alfred Kinsey. By the way, Alfred Kinsey died from masturbating too much, just so you know. Poetic justice, I'm not kidding. Um, he killed himself, okay? And Alfred Kinsey is the, let's call him the intellectual fountainhead of sex ed today. So Alfred Kinsey believed that children were sexual from birth and had sexual rights to sexual pleasure. I'm not kidding you, this man was a complete degenerate. He wrote a book called Sexuality and the Human Male. A few years later, he wrote a book called Sexuality and the Human Female. And guess who he interviewed to get data on the sexual activity of American men? and the sexual activity of American women, which he then rolled with as the standard sexual practices of all American males and all American females. Well, to get his data on the sexual activity of the American male, he strictly interviewed pimps and men who were in jail for sexual crimes. To get his data on the sexual activity of the American female, he interviewed strictly prostitutes. Then he ran with his data in his books and portrayed that data as the average sexual practices of the American male and the average sexual practices of the American female. If you want a complete debunking of Alfred Kinsey, there's no one better than Judith Reisman. 
Judith Reisman passed a couple years ago. I'm so angry I didn't get to meet her. She was a saint. She was a beautiful soul. She devoted her life work called the Reisman Institute to exposing and debunking the man called and the legacy of Alfred Kinsey. Okay? So when you hear people talk about sexuality education, all roads lead back to Kinsey. If you don't trust me, you study it yourself. It's creepy. It's freaking weird. You start looking into the organizations that craft the sex ed, that promote it nationally and internationally. Literally all roads lead to Kinsey. It's one of the most dystopic, satanic, weird things to study, to show you the demonic impact one man can have who's more passionate for his religion than most Christians are for theirs. He was more passionate about death than the church was for life. So a woman named Mary Calderon leaves an organization called Planned Parenthood. She was their medical director in 1964 to launch an organization called the Sexuality Information Education Council of the United States, otherwise known as SECUS. She launched that organization with seed money provided by Hugh Hefner, one of the greatest dehumanizers and commodifiers of the female body in American and world history. Does that concern you at all? that the high pontiffs of progressivism were at the helm of developing and writing the curriculum to sexualize young children? Right, because if you can sexualize young children and titillate the masses, it prevents rational thinking and it prevents self-government. You won't be focused on much else. Who here knows people who struggle with addiction, whether that's drugs, whether that's alcohol, whether that's sex or porn? Are they effective, engaged, responsible citizens? Are they aware of what's happening in the country? Do they care about self-government? Do they master themselves? No, and if a man can't master himself, he can't master anything else. Titillating the masses was always one of the goals of the secular moral revolution. So the organization today that is at the helm of creating, distributing, and promoting comprehensive sexuality education is called CECUS, the Sexuality Information Education Council of the United States. Kinsey's legacy was so great that he still has an institute named after him, the Kinsey Institute, and it's still at Indiana University. Oh, by the way, guess where CECUS was launched out of? Indiana University. One of CECUS's first board members was a man named Wardell Pomeroy. Wardell Pomeroy who had previously been an executive director of the Kinsey Institute at Indiana University. So you have one of the most criminal, pornographic, sexually obsessed organizations in American history cranking out the presidents and board members of the organization at the helm of creating the sex ed in your children's public schools today. Wardell Pomeroy gave an interview to Time Magazine in 1980, Alec. And Time Magazine described Wardell Pomeroy as part of the pro-incest lobby. Wardell Pomeroy said in this interview with Time Magazine, and I quote, he said, incest need not be a sign of mental illness. Incest between children and adults can sometimes be beneficial, end quote. Wardell Pomeroy said that in 1980 to Time Magazine in an interview. He was the executive director of the Kinsey Institute. This is the legacy. Sex said is the sales funnel. Abortion is the product. And your daughters are their prospects. Because if you can encourage sexual activity at young ages, they will begin going down the Planned Parenthood pipeline. The more sex you have, the more unplanned pregnancies are created. The more unplanned pregnancies are created, the more that those unborn children become prospects for the sale of abortion. This is why in California, and even I heard from Pastor Alec today in Washington, Planned Parenthood tries to hire Planned Parenthood nurses inside public schools. Now, they're not providing abortions, although in California, if you're over 12, you can get an abortion without parental consent and charge it to your 
your parents' insurance plan, and the insurance company can't notify the parents that their minor got an abortion and charged it to their own insurance plans. I know it sounds like I'm pitching you a dystopic novel idea in a hundred years America. It's happening right now in California. Mm. Anyways, I digress. This is why they try to put Planned Parenthood into schools as well, and they do it under the mantle or veneer of either sex ed or contraception or counseling so that children feel safe that they can talk to someone. By the way, do you want to know one of the organizations that provides much of the transgender drugs that are hormone blockers or cross uh, sex hormones? Planned Parenthood is one of the number one providers of those drugs. So guess what? Those who chop up children in the womb will have no problem chopping them up outside the womb and targeting them for abuse as well. Wake up. This is what we're contending against. And so when brave Ezekiel Watchman parents, mothers and fathers, papa bears and mama bears started coming to school board meetings in the last 18 months, did you see this parental, like almost tea party level organic grassroots movement of blasting the Satanists at school boards who push porn pornographic Kinsey-inspired sex ed, what did Merrick Garland, the attorney general, the pissed off almost Supreme Court justice that cocaine Mitch McConnell made sure didn't get on the Supreme Court, what did he label all of you? Domestic terrorists? Now I have a six minute speech where I blast on my school board and I explain the legacy of, of, of sex ed, which Charlie Kirkery shared and a bunch of people saw. So I'm a domestic terrorist. If you're a domestic terrorist, come up and say hi to me afterwards. Of course, if you burnt down whole city blocks and murdered off duty police officers and burnt down majority black owned businesses in, a ma in Democrat major metropolitan cities, that was mostly peaceful and a little bit fiery. My point is this, justice is dead. And one of the reasons justice is dead is because of our toleration of child sacrifice and our making peace with people either elected or unelected who are pro-abortion. Those who murder the unborn cannot be trusted to govern the born. As long as our country continues to deny the natural right to life to an entire class of human beings, our own rights will constantly be endangered by modern jurists and a ruling class whose jurisprudence is completely foreign to the founding fathers. By ignoring the natural right to life that all human beings have, we should not be surprised when that government ignores every other right that flows from that first and most important of all. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah, wow. So what are you seeing? Uh, yeah, thank you, that's, that's worth interrupting. It's, right? it's wicked, right, yeah. yeah. God help us. What are you seeing in a positive way since Roe v. Wade was overturned? What are you seeing happening in many states around the country? Well, we, I, we who live in Washington, yeah. we have to live in the sunlight of other yeah. states sometimes. Well, I mean, you know, I just moved to Kansas and I thought I was moving to a very conservative state. And Kansas just voted against the value them both amendment that wasn't even gonna ban abortion at the state level. It was just gonna send it back to the people and write the codification of Roe out of the Kansas state constitution. Yeah. And they're losing their freaking minds. Uh, on a 30,000 foot spiritual level, um, before I answer your question, Alec, it reminds me of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Do you remember this in scripture? It's like, set up the, set up the uh, sacrifice, set up the altar. My, Yahweh will rain down fire from heaven. And then the prophets of Baal are like, where are you, Moloch? And Elijah goes up, he's like, where's your God? Is he taking a poop? <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm actually not embellishing. Yeah. Actually, I'm, I'm not. So if, if you're like Seth, Alec, he shouldn't speak like that. Elijah literally goes to the prophets of Baal and he goes, where's your God? Is he relieving himself? Okay. I think we need more of that kind of spirit and confidence in our faith in the church today. Where's your God? Is he on the dump? Because we need to recognize this was always a spiritual battle. And when God's people stand up, Satan sits down. And I'll prove it to you. We know from 40 Days for Life and Sidewalk Advocates for Life and Love Life and other organizations that inspire and train people to do sidewalk counseling, and we know from when abortion workers leave the industry and join the pro-life movement, we've heard these stories for years from people who used to be inside the centers killing babies. When they convert, they'll tell pro-lifers, they'll be like, hey, pro-lifers, I just want you to know now that I don't hate your guts, <laughs> I want you to know that when you, you, oh, you Christian Christians were out there praying every day outside of our killing centers, we would see an upwards of a 60 to 70% no-show for abortion appointments. Wait a second. Wait, why would that happen? 
Uh, it's called a conscience. It's called a still small voice. Script, scripture says eternity is written on the heart of man. So men and women know that when they're walking in, they feel shame. And that's why they don't want to be seen by others walking in. Brothers and sisters, if it was a polyp and just an organ, do you think they would feel conviction when weird pro-lifers were out there saying, organs have rights. Like, no, no, they'd flip us off and be like, you weirdos, science denier, conspiracy theorists. It's only because they know deep down it's a baby that they have the shame associated with being seen, which is why they don't show up for the appointment when the church shows up. This is our moment. Now, what's happening at the state level? Well, either if you're pro-life, you're doubling down on protecting life, or if you're pro-abortion, you're quadrupling down on protecting abortion, which is why one of the bills in California right now is to propose using taxpayer dollars to pay a woman who's maybe coming out of Arizona, where abortion's more regulated, to pay her for, to reimburse her for her gas, her food, her travel expenses, her hotel, the actual abortion she would get in California, and her babysitting expenses to pay the babysitter to watch her toddlers back in Arizona that need to be watched while she kills their sibling. This is a bill being proposed right now in California. So Washington, Oregon, California, uh, unfortunately Michigan, Maine, New York, and these other pro-abortion states are quadrupling down on protecting abortion. And here's the bad news, and I'll follow with good news. They're planning to kill more babies after the overturning of Roe versus Wade than before. And I know that sounds weird because you're like, but Seth, Roe v. Wade is overturned. Those states will have it banned. Here's why. There's something called RU486 or the abortion pill, or medication abortion. Very quickly, it's a two-regimen pill, mifepristone and misoprostol, or mifeprex and misoprostol. The first pill blocks the hormone progesterone. All nutrients through the umbilical cord is cut off, and the baby starves to death. 48 hours later, you take misoprostol, which forces your uterus to have contractions, and Planned Parenthood tells you to sit on the toilet, flush, and don't look. And we know this from women who have dealt with Planned Parenthood. Once again, I'm not speaking hyperbolically. They tell you flush and don't look because they don't want you to see the humanity of your baby. RU486 is taken through 10 weeks. Last year, the Biden administration through the FDA removed the safety regulations on the sale of the abortion pill. Prior to March or May of 2021, you could only get the abortion pill if you showed up for an in-person evaluation with a physician. The reason for that was to do an ultrasound to ensure that mom didn't have an ectopic pregnancy because if she does, her, her fallopian tube bursts and she dies. The second reason is to confirm gestational age. I know from talking to pro-life obstetricians all around the country who I have on my show, up to 50% of women will be one to five weeks off of how far along they think they are. So guys, if the abortion pill's taken through 10 weeks, which by the way, it used to be eight weeks, and then a few years ago, they just randomly increased it to 10 weeks. They, they gave no medical explanation as to why. If she thinks she's eight weeks along, but she's 12 or 13, and she takes the abortion pill, what might happen? The baby will probably still be killed, but it leads to incomplete abortions, meaning dead floating baby pieces in mom's uterus, making her susceptible to sepsis and death. So notice the safety regulations on the sale of the abortion pill were not supported by pro-lifers strictly. They used to be supported by pro-abortionists. Not because they cared about the baby, but just because they didn't want mom unnecessarily dying. And the FDA through the Biden administration lifted those last year. So now do you know what we have? Mail order murder. We now have medication telemedicine abortion shipped through the American Postal Services to women's mailboxes. So even in states like Oklahoma with brave Governor Kevin Stitt, unless you pass laws that empower the post office to look through the mail to take out the deadly poisonous abortion pills, there's no way to protect the life of that unborn child. Even in a pro-life state that bans abortion. And now with the abortion pill, they don't have to pay the lease on abortion clinic buildings. They don't have to pay the abortion staff. <laughs> they don't have to pay the third party vendors that come away and they take all the dead baby limbs. You know that Planned Parenthood, they usually don't flush them. They dispose of them and then someone comes and picks up the baby limbs. You gotta pay someone to do that. And then sometimes states don't have enough abortionists. So abortion clinics sometimes fly abortionists back and forth to kill babies at different centers. Look at all the overhead expenses the abortion industry just got rid of by producing a low cost, sell at high margins, poisonous abortion pill. 
So make no doubt about it, the abortion industrial complex intends to target more babies, kill more babies, even in pro-life states that have banned abortion. This is the battlefield before us, and if you think that utilizing political power to go through the mail to get abortion pills out is somehow anti-American, or, or that, that's too much, that's, too, that's wielding too much political power, you don't know the history of America. We have something called the Comstock Laws that Margaret Sanger was breaking in the 1920s when she fled to Europe to sleep around with Havelock Ellis, another crazy Kinsey-like European sexual revolution revolutionaries, and the reason she fled New York was because she was trying to titillate the masses by putting pornographic materials in the American Postal Service, and the Comstock laws empowered American Postal Services to get that pornographic material out of the post office. This is within American uh, tradition, and if we can't do it to prevent the murder of babies, what can we do it for? So that's a little bit of the horizons we're facing right now. Wow, wow. So this is more than just a single issue. Uh, one of the things that when I, in 2020, when I spoke about abortion pre, pre the election in 2020, we lost some people because they said you're just a single issue voter. It's one of the questions we got. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, you're single. So it's so funny, like you ask someone who says that, like, so are you telling me like in 1855, right when Stephen Douglas is preparing to run for his presidential aspirations against Abraham Lincoln, are, are you telling me that you wouldn't be single issue? You know, you guys, guys, come on, be open-minded. You bigot, Alec. Listen, the Democrat Party, I know they lynch black people and they treat them like cattle and they enslave them, but listen... <laughs> They're really good at life policies for, for non-black people. You know, they, they have, they have um, a nanny state solution for poorer white people who aren't enslaved and treat like cattle. And, and, and th their livelihood matters too. And so look, look past um, intrinsic evils in order to maybe prevent contingent evils. Just allow the injustice of slavery um, because they're going to do really good things for half black and Aryan races, and their livelihoods matter too. So you should support quality of life um, policies, Alec. Come on. It's, it's like when you put it in this in, you know, context, it seems so asinine, right? Of course, everyone says they'd be a single issue voter if they lived in 1850. We would say that party needs to be handed over to Satan and thrown out into utter darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I would say, yeah, it needs to be the same thing today because the Democrat Party today just has found a new victim class that they claim is a human non person. <laughs> it's the same thing they said about the black man in 1850. Dred Scott v. Sanford did not make an argument that the black man was not a homo sapien, a human, <laughs> that said that they're not persons. And in 1973, in Roe versus Wade, it said the term person is used in the Constitution does not include the unborn. And, and so genocidal agendas and governments, guys, have always separated the term human from person. You need to understand this. By the way, anytime the, the uh, pro-abortion lobby tells you that the unborn is a human but not a person, they admit to you that, of course, it's human because it has human parents, right? It's not a seahorse. And they're like, but it's not a person, so it doesn't have rights. Uh, here, I got two questions for you to make you pro-life ninjas, okay? First question, um, what's the difference between a human and a person? Any answer they give you, listen, will be a difference found amongst all born people as well. The argument for killing the unborn cannot be confined to the womb. Those arguments work equally well to kill born people, and we can get into those arguments if you want. Here's the second question. Have you ever met a human that's not a person? Because I haven't. I'd be fascinated to see a picture of one. Do you have any pictures on your iPhone? And unfortunately, that pro-abortion advocate would probably take you in a time machine with Marty McFly back to 1850 America. Oh, right when the same political party believed the same thing about a different victim class, that they were humans but not persons. Mm. So if the unborn child is a person and they have a right to life, and the born person or the slave is a person with rights, then you should be just as much of a single issue voter on child sacrifice as you tell yourself you would be if you lived in 1850. So the people who say that, Pastor Alec, to quote Hadley Arcus, the natural law scholar, are not possessed of a lively sense that there are real human beings getting killed in these surgeries. Mm. Because if they were possessed of that lively sense, oh, they'd be the biggest partisan yeah. hacks you know. Yeah, absolutely. Because they would recognize that the GOP, while imperfect, and I'm happy to blast the GOP all day, by the way, guys, would recognize that that's the only political party that presents a viable option to end the genocide of abortion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
What approach would you recommend for talking with people who do not believe or at least recognize that life has inherent value? Is there a conversational pathway to lead them to the truth? Yeah, that's good. So we are reaping the consequences of giving the culture wars over to the Marxists and over to the sexual revolutionaries and over to the Darwinists, right? Who claim that uh, the end of man is the survival of the fittest, right, Alec? Because there's no dignity attached to the individual. We're just kind of cosmic sludge pounding around in the universe. And so the end of that worldview is that the strong kill the weak. Might makes right. That was Darwin's vision. Uh, and by the way, Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, and all these people, the eugenicists from the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, um, were all devotees of Charles Darwin. Right? Uh, and so we have given those culture wars over to those people for so long. And now it's hard to even convince many young people and some of the older people from the sexual revolution um, that, um, yeah, we have a right to life and humans have dignity. And yeah. they have value, not because of what they can do or how they look, but simply because they're human beings. Yeah. And they bear the image of God. Yeah. You say that to a pink-haired feminist studies, lesbian dance theory major at UC Berkeley, and their eyes glaze over. It's like the weird, and I was just at UC Berkeley, by the way. I can tell you, it's like, it's like I'm speaking French. It's not, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's funny in a way, but it's not. It's very tragic how much of the culture that we have lost. And so, as always, you just take your first step. But it is going to require an awakening. But maybe here's the answer this person was looking for. I do think that eternity is written on the heart of man. And I do think that God's reign falls on the just and the unjust. I do believe in common grace. I do believe when Paul said that people are left without excuse. I do believe that God's revealed enough of himself through nature, through a conscience, and through creation to testify of himself. And I believe that there's enough of a seed of common sense left to water and build upon in the minds of many of the people on the left or the secular progressives, whatever you want to call them. And so I think a step in the right direction after we pray, of course, and gird up our loins is to make the point that there is no end to the tyrannical, despotic arguments of the abortion industry. Here's what I mean by that. By accepting the rationale of abortion arguments, you are putting in place the premises that justify your own enslavement. Abraham Lincoln, preparing for what would be the famous Stephen Douglas debates. Have you, have you heard of those, the Stephen Douglas debates? Stephen Douglas was personally against slavery. Uh, he didn't want to buy slaves, even though he was actually a planta plantation owner known slave. But he said he supported the right of each state to vote it up or down. And Lincoln, in 1854, in a piece of paper we have today called Fragments on Slavery, Lincoln writes out his core argument against the pro-slavery Democrats. I want to tell you what he wrote because it's the same flaw present in pro-abortion arguments today. Here's what Lincoln said. He's pretending that he's in an in imagined debate with a slavery supporter. Here's what Lincoln says. You say A is white and B is black. It is color then. The lighter has the right to enslave the darker. Well, take care, because by this reasoning, uh, the next man you meet with a skin fairer than your own can enslave you. Mm. Then he says, but you say it is not color necessarily. You say that it is a matter of intellect, that whites are intellectually the superiors of blacks and therefore have the right to enslave them. Take care again, because the next man you meet with an intellect superior to your own can enslave you. And then Lincoln finishes and he says, but you say it is a matter of interest. And then if you can make it in your interest, you have the right to enslave another. Very well. And if he can make it in his interest, he has the right to enslave you. What is Honest Abe teaching us? He's teaching us that if you ground rights on things that come in varying degrees, it inevitably follows that rights therefore come in varying degrees. Hmm. Because even if us white folks in here put our palms out together like this this evening, would we all have the same exact shade of skin color? Even us white folks, which we're all being told are evil, evil people that participate in systems of oppression, we would find that our skin color comes in varying degrees. But if the argument for slavery was based on skin color, 
then it would follow that the albino rules over all. And even if you were a Caucasian, but you were slightly darker in skin than the albino, you would be slightly less of a person with slightly less rights therein. Do you see? Same thing with intellect. The person with the greatest IQ would be more of a person with more rights than those with a smaller IQ. The only way to maintain this idea that we're obsessed with in America called human equality, because have you noticed, by the way, the less obsessed with the term equality? What was the, what was the symbolism and marketing for trying to, for Obergefell, for legalizing gay marriage? The equal sign, marriage equality. What's their arguments for abortion? Women's equality. The argument was always for women to be equal with men, they have to be able to get abortion so that they can, they can climb the corporate lab, ladder and not be prevented by child rearing. It was always this appeal to equality, but the very equality the left is seeking cannot be secured or maintained by their own worldview because they put in place premises that compromise the rights not just of the unborn, but of all human beings. So let me cap it with this. Let me bring it back to the flaws in abortion arguments that Lincoln pointed out were the flaws in pro-slavery arguments. They admit that the unborn is a human because it has human parents, but they say it's not a person. And how do they justify that? They say, well, Alec, the unborn child is not self-aware. They can't feel pain. They're not viable. Uh, they don't have any desires. Have you ever heard these arguments? It's an appeal to the functions of the unborn rather than on their status as a human being. And this has always been the divide amongst people who acknowledge the dignity and inherent worth of life, which the question was, and those who don't. We hold to the endowment view. We hold these truths to be self-evident. So we're endowed. It's a beautiful word. It means we were given. Mm. Meaning I can't give you these natural rights and I can't take them away. Endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. That among these are the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The left embraces something called the performance view of personhood. That says you're only valuable and have rights that I should respect if you can perform or function in a certain way. You might also know this worldview by the term utilitarianism. By what you provide and how you function. So they're saying the baby's not a person, therefore we can kill them. And we haven't compromised their rights because they don't have rights. Why? Because they're not self-aware. Okay. Um, are you self-aware when you're sleeping? How about when you're in a coma? How about if some of us have walked through the difficult journey of one of our grandparents or elderly family members being in a coma or having dementia or Alzheimer's? Are they fully self-aware? No. Can we kill them? By the rationale that the pro-abortion advocate has, has absorbed, yes. Because they fail to meet the same litmus test for personhood that the unborn fails to meet. Back to Mildred Jefferson, today it is the unborn child, tomorrow it is likely to be the elderly or those who are incurably ill. What about ability to feel pain? Have you ever heard that one? Oh, what's it, what's it to the child? They can't feel pain. Ever heard of a disease called congenital analgesia or congenital insensitivity to pain? Very rare. It's a condition in which you cannot feel any pain. Hey, leftists, can we kill people with congenital analgesia? Because like the baby in the womb, they can't feel any pain. And they go, humana, 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 uh, no, I don't like that. Why? It's the natural application of your own premises and worldview. Here's another example. The baby doesn't have any desires. Have you heard this one before? Like, the, the baby doesn't know they're being aborted. They, they don't have a desire for a right to life. They're not even aware of their own existence. So what's it to them? This is another argument that's used to deperson the unborn. Okay, let's apply that same rationale this side of the womb. If you have suicidal tendencies... Do you desire to go on living? Can we kill people with suicidal tendencies? Because like the unborn, they do not have a desire for a right to life. What about Buddhists who reach nirvana? Now, I'm not convinced nirvana is something that can be realized. But according to Buddhists, if you reach nirvana, you eradicate any and all desires. Which would include the desire to go on living. So hey, pro-choicer, can we murder nirvana Buddhists? Because like the baby in the womb, they don't desire to go on living. Do you see how the argument to kill the unborn cannot be confined to the womb? Any argument used to deperson the unborn can also be used to deperson some born person mm. who fails to meet the functionalist account or litmus test for personhood. It's the same flaw present in slavery arguments as in abortion arguments today. It says being human is not enough. 
you must perform or function in a certain way. And we, the high priests of progressivism, we get to decide what those check boxes and litmus tests for personhood are. However, ironically, they would never allow the right pro-lifers or conservatives to invent our own litmus test for personhood and say, actually, uh, it's being a leftist who believes that not all humans are persons that obviously makes you mentally deficient. And so this is my conservative litmus test for personhood. And so we're just going to round you all up and put you into conservative gulag. Something tells me they would say, well, you can't just invent a litmus test for personhood and say that I'm mentally deficient. What gives you the right to decide who gets to live and who gets to die and what properties are necessary in order to have rights? Uh-huh. And the same applies for you. They never explain why the possession of the given functions they require the unborn to meet are value giving in the first place. They just assume it. And you know what happens when you assume? You make a, okay. C.S. Lewis once said that the most dangerous ideas in a society are not the ones being argued for. They're the ones being assumed. Because assumed premises, especially when undetected, can destroy a nation. And that's more true today on the issue of life than any other issue. We have generations of Americans who have been born in a Roe versus Wade political and cultural yeah. fabric. Yeah who have been fed the lie that some humans are not persons and the state gets to decide which humans qualify for the status of personhood. So I'll leave you with this. If you're personally pro-life, but you don't have this heavy burden on your heart for the unborn, maybe you just feel more burdened by other issues. By the way, I believe God calls his warriors to many different battlefronts. It's fine if you feel called to a different arena for the fight for life and liberty. That's beautiful. However, the longer we tolerate the genocide of abortion, the sooner our own rights will deteriorate yeah. and the sooner yeah. you will deteriorate spiritually inside. G.K. Chesterton once said that unless a man becomes the enemy of an evil, he will not even become its slave, but rather its champion. Think about that for a second. Mm. What's Chesterton getting at? He's saying there's no such thing as moral neutrality. Yeah. Which is why yeah. Bonhoeffer once said, silence in the face of evil is itself evil. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. God will not hold us guiltless. What the enemy of our souls wants, brothers and sisters, is to keep you in the position of confessing all of the right beliefs, but doing nothing to resist the spirit of the age yeah. and his obsession with killing babies, yeah. which is why C.S. Lewis in his book, The Screwtape Letters, beautifully depicted one of our enemy's core strategies. Listen to me. If you forget anything else I say this night, remember this one. The core strategy of the enemy of our souls is to keep you feeling broken about sin in the world, but doing nothing to stop it. And so in the most prescient line in the screw tape letters, screw tape tells his nephew, demon Wormwood, he says, Hey, Wormwood, as the humans have said, active habits are strengthened by repetition, but passive ones are weakened. The longer he or she, the Christian, the longer he feels without acting, the less he will be able ever to act. And in the long run, the less he will be able to feel at all. What's C.S. Lewis saying? If we can keep the Christians feeling broken about the evil that they see in the world, but not acting or doing anything about it, the longer we can keep them spiritually impotent like that, the sooner they won't act at all about the evil that they see. And if we can keep them feeling broken about sin and not acting for long enough, eventually they actually won't feel at all. You'll become a spiritually degenerate little couch potato whose orthodoxy and Christian beliefs make Satan laugh. Mm. Which is why Eberhard Bethke, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's best friend and one of the members of the Confessing Church, once beautifully spelled out the same strategy that they were facing in the 1940s. And Bethke said, Bonhoeffer introduced us in 1935 to the problem of what we today call political resistance. The levels of confession, meaning words, and resistance could no longer be kept neatly apart. The escalating persecution of the Jews generated an increasingly intolerable situation, especially for Bonhoeffer, because we now realize that mere confession, yeah. no yeah. matter how courageous, inescapably meant complicity with the murderers 
even though there would always be new acts of refusing to be co-opted. And even though we could preach Christ alone from our pulpit Sunday after Sunday, the Nazis never considered it necessary to prohibit our preaching. Okay, pause. Why is Bethke saying that, Bonhoeffer's best friend? Why is he saying that? Why were the Nazis not concerned with preventing the preaching of the Christians of the Deutsche Christens, the German church? Because their preaching posed no spiritual or political threat to the prevailing regime that was murdering Jews. It was confession and no resistance. It was feeling broken and not doing anything yeah. to stop the genocide unfolding before your very eyes. And so Bethke ends by saying this, thus we were approaching a borderline between confession and resistance. And if we did not cross this border soon, our confession was going to be no better than cooperation with the criminals. Yeah. And so it became clear where the problem lay for the confessing church. We were resisting by way of confession, but we were not confessing by way of resistance. That's what the enemy wants for the church today, for you to confess orthodoxy and have no, no orthopraxy, to have right belief and no right action, yeah. to which our spiritual forefathers would say, faith without works is dead. Show me your faith apart from your, show me your works apart from your faith and I will show you my, your, my faith by my works. Mm -hmm. A good tree does not bear bad fruit, neither does a bad tree bear good fruit. This has always been the struggle for Christians during times of tyranny. Yeah. It's to even sometimes speak about the evil that you see, but not to the degree that it would piss off the enemy of our souls. And I'll leave you with this call to action. Ever heard of a guy named Lot? <laughs> he was the Christian influencer of his day. Did you know that? Sodom and Gomorrah? Where's Lot when the angels come to Sodom? At the city gates. He had a position of influence and authority. He was the Christian influencer of his day. And when the angels come to fire and brimstone that city, Lot takes the angels to his house, right? To protect him. And then what does it say? It says, men from all the parts of the city, so from every part of culture. Does that feel like that today? Come to him, a man of faith, and say, bring those men out that we might have sex with them. Now. Scripture says that Lot was a righteous man. Do you remember? Lot believed and confessed the right beliefs. He even spoke the truth, but he wasn't willing to stand for the truth or die on the mat for his own children. Yeah. And so what does he tell the wicked men that come to his home? Here are my daughters. Yeah. Have sex with them. Lot was saved, but he wasn't salty. So his wife becomes in death what he should have been in life, the pillar of salt. Brothers and sisters, you can be saved but not salty. Yeah. You can barely get into the kingdom by the skin on your bum and worship your Savior forever, but you wasted everything you were given yeah. as a steward. Do you know how important stewardship is to our Savior? Remember the parable of the talents? What was Jesus' response to the man who buried the talent and left it there? He will be thrown out into utter darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, Ed Stetzer and Russell Moore and Tim Keller would say, Jesus, that's not very winsome. That's very rude for you to speak that way. We only talk that way about sex traffickers. That's how Christ felt about spoiling and not stewarding what we were given. Yeah. We have a moment in this late, late hour to end the Holocaust of abortion, contend for righteousness in the political square so that unlike Lot, we can stand before our Savior one day when we're told, well done, my good and faithful servant, and we can quote the words of William Wilberforce, that great British abolitionist to our king, by simply saying, Lord, let it not be said of me. Yeah. And I was silent yeah. when they needed me. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Thank you. We're going to go straight into an altar call right now. <laughs> um, thank you for being here. Uh, just out of curiosity, how many of you come from churches other than Westgate Chapel? Would you raise your hand? Look at that. 
Marvelous. Welcome. Thank you. Awesome. And please come on October 1st, Cedar Park Church, Love Life Washington, Eric Metaxas. Come on. Right? Yeah. And me and some other people. And Pastor Alec and Pastor Jay of Cedar Park Church. It's going to be lightning. It's going to be fire. Okay? So, and you're going to be poured into, equipped, and encouraged to stand yeah. in a moment like today. So please don't miss it. If you want to connect with me, we have some info here on the screen of the White Rose Resistance. If you scan that, you can connect with my organization. We're raising up allies of the White Rose. If you want to join that, just scan that. But please, come here, Alec, and myself, and Eric Metaxas, and others on October 1st. LoveLifeWashington.org, I believe. Uh, buy the tickets. It's not much. Join us. We'd love to see you again, because we want to take back life in Washington State. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One last time, would you join me in thanking Seth Gruber for being with us tonight? Thank you, Seth. Thanks so much for tuning into the show today, guys. I hope you enjoyed that conversation and wonderful apology event with Pastor Alec Rollins of Westgate Chapel. Hey, if you enjoy this podcast and this has been helpful for you, would you give the show a rating and review? We really appreciate that. It really helps us reach more people. If you're on iTunes, just scroll to the bottom, hit five stars, leave a review. It drives it up the ratings, more people see it, and we really appreciate that. If you have not yet subscribed at Rumble, would you please do that for me? I've told you about Google and YouTube's crackdown on what they call misinformation and disinformation, which is usually correct information that might compromise the liberal regime and the abortion industrial complex. And so if things ever go south, for me and I'm taken off of YouTube or heavily censored. We want to continue reaching people on a free platform that reflects, respects free speech. So head on over to Rumble, Seth Gruber, A Voice for the Unborn. Subscribe to the channel there. We really appreciate that. If you want to book me for an event or see me speak live and local soon, head on over to SethGruber.com, S-E-T-H-G-R-U-B as in baby boy, E-R.com. And if you want to become an ally of the White Rose Resistance, go to the whiterose.com. Life. Thanks so much. Until next week, I'm Seth Gruber, and this is Unaborted.